He lay with one leg bent beneath him, his jaw in his throat, his face neither expressive nor inexpressive. One eye was shut, the other was a star-shaped hole. Talk, Kiowa said. The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien Ambush When she was nine, my daughter Kathleen asked if I had ever killed anyone. She knew about the war. She knew I had been a soldier. You keep writing these story, war stories, she said, so I guess you must have killed somebody. It was a difficult moment. But I did what seemed right, which was to say, of course not, and then to take her on to my lap and hold her for a while. Some day I hope she'll ask again, but here I want to pretend she's a grown-up. I want to tell her exactly what happened, or what I remember happening, and then I want to, her, to say to her that as a little girl she was absolutely right. This is why I keep writing more stories. He was sh a short, slender young man of about twenty. I was afraid of him, afraid of something. And he passed me on the trail. I threw a grenade that exploded at his feet, and I killed him. Or to go back. Shortly after midnight, we moved into the ambush site outside my cave. The whole platoon was there, spread out in the dense brush along the trail, and for five hours, nothing at all happened. We were working in two main man teams, one man on guard while the other slept, switching e every two hours. And I remember it was still dark when Kiowa shook me awake for the final watch. The night was foggy and hot. For the first few moments I felt lost, not sure about directions, groping for my helmet and weapon. I reached out and found three grenades and lined them up in front of me. The pins had already been straightened for quick throwing, and then for maybe half an hour I kneeled there and waited. Very gradually in tiny slivers, dawn began to break through the fog, and from my position in the brush I could see ten or fifteen meters up the trail. The mosquitoes were fierce. I remember slapping at them, wondering if I should wake up Kiowa and ask for some repellent, then thinking, thinking it was a bad idea. Then looking up and seeing the young man come out of the fog, he wore black clothing and rubber sandals and a gray ammunition belt. His shoulders were slightly stooped, his head cocked to the side as if listening for something. He seemed at ease. He carried his weapon in one hand, muzzle down, moving with any, without any hurry up the trail of the of the center of the trail. There were no sound at all, none that I can remember. In a way, it seemed he was part of the morning fog or my own imagination. But there was also the reality of what had happened in my stomach. What was happening in my stomach? I had already pulled the pin on a grenade. I had come up to a crouch, and it was entirely automatic. I did not hate the young man. I did not see him as the enemy. I did not ponder issues of morality or politics, or military duty. I crouched and kept my head low. I tried to swallow whatever was rising from my stomach, which tasted like lemonade, something fruity and sour. I was terrified. There were no thoughts about killing. The grenade was to make him go away, just evaporate. And I leaned back and felt my mind go empty, and then I felt it fill up again. I had already thrown the grenade before telling myself to throw it. The brush was thick, and I had to lob it high, not aiming, and I remember the grenade seeming to freeze above me for an instant as if a camera had clicked. And I remember ducking down and holding my breath and seeing little wisps of fog rise from the earth. The grenade bounced once and rolled across the trail. It did not, I did not hear it, but there must have been a sound because the young man dropped his weapon and began to run. Just two or three quick steps. Then he hesitated, swiveling to his right, and he glanced down at the grenade and tried to cover his head but never did. It occurred to me that he was about to die. I wanted to warn him. The grenade made a popping sound. Not soft, but not loud either. Not what I expected. And there was a puff of dust and smoke, a small white puff, and the young man seemed to jerk upward as if pulled by invisible wires. He fell on his back. His rubber sandals had been blown off. There was no wind. He lay at the center of the trail, his right leg bent beneath him, his one eye shut, his other eye a huge star-shaped hole. It was not a matter of li life or death. There was no real peril. Almost as certainly the young man would have passed by, and it will always be that way. Later I remember Kiowa tried to tell me that the man would have died anyways. He told me that it was a good kill, that I was a soldier, and this was a war. That I should shape up and stop staring and ask myself what the dead man would have done if things were reversed. None of it mattered. The word seemed far too complicated. All I could do was gape at the fact of the young man's body. Even now, I haven't finished sorting it out. Sometimes I forgive myself, other times I don't. 
in the ordinary hours of life i try not to dwell on it but now and then when i'm reading a newspaper or just sitting alone in a room i look up and see the young man coming out of the morning fog i watch him walk toward me his shoulders slightly stooped his head cocked to the side and he'll pass within a few yards of me and suddenly smile at some secret thought and then continue up the trail to where it bends back into the fog the things they carried by tim o'brien style there was no music most of the hamlet had burned down including her house which was now smoke and the girl danced with her eyes half closed but her feet bare she was maybe fourteen she had black hair and brown skin why is she dancing azar said we searched through the wreckage but there wasn't much to find rat kiley's caught a chicken for dinner lieutenant cross radioed up to the gunships and told them to go away the girl danced mostly on her toes she took tiny steps in the dirt in front of her house sometimes making a slow swirl, twirl sometimes smiling to herself why is she dancing azar said and henry dobbin said it didn't matter why she was just she just was later we found her family in the house they were dead and badly burned it wasn't a big family an infant and an old woman and a woman whose age was hard to tell when we dragged them out the girl kept dancing she put the palms of her hands against her ears which must have meant something and she danced sideways for a short while and then backwards she did a graceful movement with her hips well i don't get it azar said the smoke from the hooches smelled like straw it moved in patches across the village square not thick any more sometimes just faint ripples like fog there were dead pigs too the girl went up to on her toes and made a slow turn and danced through the, the smoke her face was had a dreamy look quiet and composed a while later when we moved out of the hamlet she was still dancing probably some weird ritual azar said but henry dobbins looked back and said no the girl just liked to dance that night after we marched away from the smoking village azar mocked the girls dancing he did funny jumps and spins he put the palms of his hands against his ears and danced sideways for a while and then backwards and then did an erotic thing with his hips but henry dobbins who moved gracefully for such a big man took his heart from behind and lifted him up and carried him over to a deep well and asked if he wanted to be dumped in Azar said no. All right then, Henry Dobbins said. Dance right.